Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome to another video in our Creep Week series where we discuss some of the creepiest cases out there in the spirit of Halloween. This video is part two of our two-part Long Island serial killer case. In part one, we discussed all of the victims that are thought to be connected to the Long Island serial killer, with the exception of Shannon, who isn't totally connected to him. We don't know if the same person responsible for her death is responsible for the deaths of all of the other women that we discussed. In this part, we will be discussing even more about the timeline in Shannon's death, as well as other victims that are thought to be connected to the Long Island serial killer but aren't totally connected yet, as well as a list of suspects in this case, who they are, and how they might be connected to this case. I also want to point out that just like last video, my voice is still a little bit off. Last time I was pretty congested, then I lost my voice actually, so I'm coming back from totally losing my voice. I had to go to work one day, no one could understand me because of how raspy my voice was. It was cracking, it was going in and out, it was rough. So yesterday I went the entire day without speaking a word. I tried to talk as little as possible. I literally zipped it, did not say a word almost all day to conserve my voice. So it is coming back, it's feeling a lot better. It's never really been sore this entire time. I just kind of lost my voice and it's finally coming back. So hopefully it lasts throughout this video. If there is a time where I look different, I clearly come back in a different outfit or something, it might be because I lost my voice halfway through the video and I had to finish it another time. So let's hope that doesn't happen, but just so you guys know, that is why my voice sounds like this, but the show must go on. So this is what you're getting today. Also, before we get into this part, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Apostrophe. I've been working with Apostrophe for a while now and it's been so helpful in my life. When it comes to skincare, it's so overwhelming for me to know exactly what my skin needs. I've always suffered with dryness and redness and red patches all over my skin and it's super overwhelming to figure out exactly what my skin type needs by going to the store and looking at all the options or looking it up online and seeing what all these different articles suggest. It's just overwhelming. That's why I was so excited to start working with Apostrophe. Apostrophe is an online platform that connects you with an expert dermatology team that provides you customized skincare treatment for your unique skin. Through Apostrophe, you can have access to topical and oral medications that use clinically proven ingredients to help clear up your skin. All you have to do is fill out an online consultation about your skin goals, your medical history, take a couple of selfies, and a board-certified dermatologist will create your first customized treatment plan. For me, I have issues with rosacea. I've always just gotten these weird random red patches on my skin. Sometimes they appear when I wake up. Sometimes they're there after a shower. Sometimes they pop up in the middle of a work day or in the middle of a workout and I had no idea what was causing them. It was so frustrating trying to figure out on my own exactly how to make it stop. So that is why I was so happy to work with Apostrophe. It was nice knowing that with my incredibly busy schedule, all I had to do was go online and a real dermatologist was going to look at my results and come up with my treatment plan. Then when my treatment came in the mail, it came with such cute packaging and then it came with a cute postcard that gives me helpful hints as well as stickers so I can customize my own prescription bottle. It just makes everything feel that much more customized to me. The exciting news is that Apostrophe has a special deal for viewers of this channel. You can get your first visit for only $5 when you use my link down below and head to apostrophe.com slash Rachel Shannon and use code Rachel Shannon. That is $15 off of your visit when you use my link down below. Click begin visit and then use code Rachel Shannon at sign up and then you can get $15 off of your first visit. Thank you again so much to Apostrophe for sponsoring today's video. So now let's go ahead and review the victims that we discussed in part one. We have Shannon Gilbert who went missing on May 1st, 2010 near Gilgo Beach in Oak Beach. 
During the searches for Shannon, police discovered four bodies on Gilgo Beach on December 11, 2010. These four bodies are referred to as the Gilgo Four, Maureen Brunade Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. These were all sex workers who posted their ads to Craigslist. They were all offered around $1,000 to $1,500 for one night in Long Island right before they went missing. When their bodies were found, they were also thought to have been strangled. Then we have Jessica Taylor, a 20-year-old escort whose torso was found in July of 2003 in a town called Manorville. Then, in March of 2011, her skull, forearms, and hands were found on Gilgo Beach. In April of 2011, three more bodies were found. There were the remains of an unidentified Asian biological male who was thought to have possibly been transgender, as well as an unidentified baby girl. Then, back in 2000, there was another torso found in Manorville. Then, in April of 2011, the rest of these remains were found on Gilgo Beach. These remains were originally called Jane Doe number six, but they were later identified as belonging to Valerie Mack, who is also a sex worker. Then, back in 1997, there was a bag containing a naked torso found near Jones Beach State Park, who belonged to a black woman between the ages of 20 and 30, who had a distinctive peach tattoo. She was referred to as Peaches. Then, in April of 2011, there was a bag found containing the arms and legs of an unidentified woman. Using DNA, these arms and legs were confirmed as belonging to Peaches. Then, also using DNA, Peaches was confirmed as being the mother of Baby Doe. Finally, there was another skull found along Ocean Parkway west of Tobe Beach in April of 2011 called Jane Doe Number 7. But back in 1996, a set of legs were found on Fire Island, about 15 miles away from Gilgo Beach, and she was called Fire Island Jane Doe until she was connected to Jane Doe number 7. In total, 10 bodies were found. Then, in December of 2011, Shannon's body was also found. Her original autopsy was inconclusive, but an independent examiner found that there is a possibility that she was strangled. So, that is where we left off in part one. Now, after the FBI joined in on the searches, there have been additional bodies found in the Long Island area. The reason I didn't originally go over these cases is because they are relatively loose connections with the Long Island serial killer and are not confirmed as being killed by the same person as the other victims that we discussed. But I do still want to discuss them just in case because these victim stories also deserve to be told, their cases also deserve to be solved, but I don't want to lump them in because if the Long Island serial killer is ever found, you know, and he wasn't responsible for these other victims, there still could be other killers out there. So, now going back all the way to February of 1982, a 19-year-old teenager named Tina Foglia was last seen on February 1st of that year. She was last seen at the Hammerheads music venue in West Islip, New York. Her body was found on February 3rd, 1982, next to the Southern State Parkway. She was found dismembered, and her body parts were spread across three garbage bags. The Southern State Parkway is about 20 minutes from Gilgo Beach. There was unknown male DNA found on the garbage bags, but obviously we still don't know who the killer is or who this DNA belongs to. Then in June of 2008, a 39-year-old woman and mother of three named Tanya Rush, her body was found dismembered and packed into a suitcase along Southern State Parkway as well. She too worked as an escort. She was last seen on surveillance video walking out of her apartment building in Brooklyn, New York before she disappeared. At the time, she was seen with a man and a woman who remain unidentified to this day. And again, we don't really know any further details about her case. So, whether or not these two victims are connected to the Long Island serial killer, it does seem that these two women are at least connected to each other. On January 13th, 2013, yet another set of human remains were found. They were found in a garbage bag along the shore in Laddington, New York, which is around a 45-minute drive north of Gilgo Beach. These remains belonged to an unidentified Asian woman, and she was wearing a 24 karat gold pig pendant, which may be a reference to the year of the pig in some Asian cultures. Then, by March 16th, 2013, at around 4.30 a.m., 31-year-old Natasha Hugo was last seen leaving her home in Queens Village, New York. 
The next day, her car was found along Ocean Beach Parkway near Gilgo Beach. Her wallet ID and some clothes were found within the car. By June 24th, 2013, unfortunately, her body was discovered washed up on Gilgo Beach about a mile from where her car had been found that March. Authorities found a set of footprints leading away to the car to the beach's edge. They also found a bathrobe as well as other clothing thought to belong to Tasha along the water's edge as well. Natasha's mother also came out to say that in the past, Natasha has had some pretty bad mental health issues where she thought that people may have been following her. So again, at this point, it's not known whether she was killed or if it was an accident or if it was a suicide. As far as I've seen, there were no signs of trauma found on her body, so I don't believe she was strangled or anything like that, but I did try to look up the autopsy. I tried to look more into this case, but unfortunately, there's just not a lot out there, and I also wasn't able to find the results of the autopsy that was performed. So, it's thought that there are as many as 16 victims of the Long Island serial killer, with the more confirmed number being closer to 10. Like I said, I don't want to speculate too much about all of this, but I will say that I personally believe that the victims who fit the killer's M.O. are much more likely to have been killed by him, but if they're unidentified and we don't know who they are, then obviously it's hard to know if they do fit his M.O. If they were women, we can't just assume that they were sex workers, but we also can't assume that they weren't if they were killed in a similar location and in a similar way to the other victims. So, it is really hard to say. That's why I do want to mention them, but I don't want to go too far and speculate and say that they are, you know, the victims of the Long Island serial killer when there could be other killers still out there. But at this point, we know that there are a ton of victims and we know that there's one or more people out there who killed these people and are still out there and walking free. So, with that being said, now we're going to be discussing the possible suspects in this case, and when I discuss these suspects, I'm discussing them in relation to being the Long Island serial killer. So, these other victims, if they are connected, if they aren't, I'm talking about suspects now of the, at least the confirmed 10. So, I'm discussing the Long Island serial killer, not the other perpetrators that could be responsible for these other murders, if that makes sense. Very long-winded way of saying, let's discuss who the Long Island serial killer could possibly be. By September of 2017, the Suffolk County District Attorney Robert Bianca Villa announced that a now 56-year-old man, 48, when he was arrested, named John Biltroff, is being arrested for having possible connections to the woman found at Gilgo Beach. So, John Biltroff was born in 1966. He grew up in Mastic Beach and moved to Manorville in 2013. John worked as a carpenter and he was the married father of two children. Neighbors described John as being an overall friendly family man. He chatted with his neighbors and he was always very pleasant to interact with and if somebody needed help, he was always willing to help them. However, in 2014, he was arrested in connection to two murders. So, first is 31-year-old Rita Tangretti. Rena had worked as a sex worker, and on the last day that she was seen, she was seen hitchhiking along Montauk Highway in East Pachigu. I do apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong, on November 1st, 1993. On November 2nd, 1993, her body was found naked and half buried in a wooded area at Esplande Drive in East Pachigu. She had been strangled and beaten to death. She was found with her skull shattered and her legs spread apart, and then she had been positioned with her arms above her head. Then, on January 5th, 1994, a 20-year-old woman named Colleen McNamee, who did also work as a sex worker, was last seen getting into a small blue car in front of a Blue Dawn diner in Islandia. By January 30th of that year, her body was also discovered in a wooded area, south of the Long Island Expressway in North Shirley. 
she had been found nude and she too was strangled and beaten. At the crime scenes of both women, detectives were able to obtain DNA samples. The DNA on each woman connected them to each other, so police knew that the person who killed each woman was the same person. Police also stated that both women were uniquely posed, but they didn't elaborate too much further on how, other than what I discussed, obviously. They also said that the same article of clothing was missing from both women, but once again, they didn't elaborate further on what these items of clothing were. Then, they found very small, almost microscopic wood shavings either on or near both women. It was also said that both women suffered such severe head wounds from being beaten that their brains were exposed when they were found. So, what connected both of these women to John was that 20 years later, in 2014, his brother Timothy had actually been arrested on a misdemeanor charge that had nothing to do with this case. But police took a DNA swab from Tim, which showed that he was connected to the DNA found on both women's bodies, but it was only a partial match. So, this led police into starting to look into his brothers. So, first, police found John's brother, Kevin. They were able to obtain his DNA from a cigarette butt that he threw out of his car after smoking it, but this DNA also was only a partial match. So, this led police to the next brother, John. Police started by setting up a camera outside of his house. Then, there was one instance where John left nine garbage bags outside, so police immediately swooped in and looked through them. So, using a plastic cup that was found within the trash bag, John was found to be a complete DNA match to the DNA found on Colleen and Rita. So, of course, John was arrested. When he was taken into the station, he was given a cup of coffee by the authorities, and of course, he drank it. So, police used the DNA from this cup to confirm the match to the DNA because, again, it was tossed in the garbage bag. I guess it could have been mixed with other DNA. So, just to confirm that this actually was John's DNA, they used this cup, which they saw John drink out of, and connected it to the DNA found on Colleen and Rita, and once again, it was a complete match. So, he went to trial, and he was found guilty for the murder of both women on July 5th, 2017, and he was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences. Now, in addition to these two women who were murdered by John, there is thought to be a third victim connected to him named Sandra Castilla. She was 28 years old when she went missing. She had been found dead on November 2nd, 1993 in a wooded area in North Sea, New York in Long Island. She too had done escort services and she was found to have been beaten very badly as well as strangled. She too was found uniquely posed and she also had the same item of clothing missing from her body but the thing separating her from the other two women is that her body was actually found mutilated. I also don't think they found DNA on her because obviously if they did, that would have given us a pretty good idea if it was his DNA or not. I also don't think that they found these microscopic wood shavings on her. Now, talking back to the other two victims with these microscopic wood shavings, John is a carpenter, so... It makes sense that he would have wood shaving somewhere on him even if he changed clothes, even if, you know, he took a shower because maybe they would be transferred into his car if he picked these women up. Any possible way that they could have gotten these wood shavings onto these women because he is a carpenter. So, I don't think they were found on Sandra because if they were, again, he might have been connected to her. So, it is thought that he is responsible, but it hasn't been made official at all. So, the reason that I'm bringing up John Bitroff is, of course, because he is thought to also be connected to being the Long Island serial killer. So, I actually found an interactive map created by the author of one of the articles that I read, of course, that will be credited down below in the description box. Either way, here is a video of where some of the victims were found in relation to one another and to where John and his father had lived. We see that Colleen and Rita were found near his current residence and his childhood home. We also see that Jane Doe number 6, who turned out to be Valerie Max Torso, is also found near his home. Then the others, such as Shannon, Melissa, and Peaches, 
were all found on this stretch of beach at Gilgo Beach. So again, many of these murders took place in the same area and then as we know, John lived in Manorville and two of the torsos that were originally found were also in Manorville. Then we know that the time frame makes sense because even though these two women were killed in 93 and 94, he wasn't caught until 2014, so he had this entire 20-year period to continue killing sex workers, and it's hard to believe that he would just kill these two or three so viciously and just leave them like that and then just stop doing it for 20 more years. Some of the victims, as we know, went missing in the late 90s, some in the 2000s, and then some in 2010. 10. We also know, again, that the vast majority of these women, if not all of them, were sex workers. So, the location, time frame, and MO, they all match. However, the way these bodies were found does not match. This is the biggest thing that people point to as being a reason why John may not be the Long Island serial killer, but I do have an explanation for this. As we know, the first three women, so Colleen and Rita were found, they were badly beaten, they weren't really hidden, they were just out there, they were in the nude, and they were uniquely posed. So, we know that the first four victims that were found were not dismembered, their remains were all together, but they were all wrapped in burlap and they were all buried next to one another on Gilgo Beach. Then, four of the other victims were found dismembered with partial remains being found on Gilgo Beach and then other partial remains being found in different areas of New York. Then, we know that there's a baby found as well as a biological Asian male and neither of them were found in burlap even though they were found on the beach and then a biological male does not fit the profile of the other victims that were killed. So, that being said, all of these different victims were found in different areas than Rita, Colleen, and Sandra and they were all found to be buried in different ways from these three victims. But to me, that is not enough to count John out. We're talking a very long span. Now, if we're talking about after Colleen and Rita, we're talking about a span that goes from 1996 until 2003. All of these victims within this time frame from 1996 until 2003, all of these victims were found dismembered and their remains were scattered. Two of their partial remains were found in Manorville, right where John lives. Then, the other victims' partial remains were found in areas within an hour of Gilgo Beach. Then, from 2007 to 2010, these victims were all found strangled and wrapped in burlap on Gilgo Beach with their bodies not being dismembered. So, to me, this still does show that this could be the work of one person whose methods have evolved over the years. So, stick with me, but as early as 93 and 94, when Colleen, Rita, and Sandra were all killed, assuming again that Sandra is connected to these other two women, John clearly didn't put much thought into covering his tracks. He was clearly very angry. He clearly had a lot of hate towards these women. Then, there's a two-year gap. From 1996 until 2003, he's a lot more careful. He kills these women, and then he takes the time to dismember them and spread their body parts across different areas in New York. All areas that he could be familiar with growing up in the same area. So, the fact that they're spread across different areas in Long Island does doesn't really matter to me because if he grew up in this area, he would be familiar with the whole stretch. Jessica Taylor and Valerie Max torsos were found right near where he lives. Then, the rest of the remains for all of these victims were found in the same area on Gilgo Beach. Then, the other two, Peaches and Fire Island Jane Doe, they were found near Gilgo Beach with the rest of their bodies found on Gilgo Beach. Then, from 2003 to 2007, there is another gap. Maybe during this time, John realizes that he isn't being caught when he's burying all of these remains on Gilgo Beach, so he decides not to put in the effort anymore to dismember these bodies. He decides that it is easier to just strangle them, which doesn't leave any sort of blood evidence for him to worry about or clean up. Then he places them in burlap and buries them. This is a lot easier than having to dismember them and going to all of these different areas to make sure they're spread out. He went all of this time from 1996 until 2007 without being caught. So, he's probably like, 
these people are never going to catch me. Why am I spending all of this time dismembering every victim when I could just wrap them in burlap and bury them all in the same place? Then we know that there is this unidentified baby found on the beach as well, which wasn't originally thought as being connected to the Long Island serial killer, but the fact that it's Peach's baby that makes the connection for me. Like I said in part one, I think it's very possible that Peach has had her baby with her when she was doing these escort services. If she was an escort, I don't want to assume that, but if she is the victim of the Long Island serial killer and she was an escort, she could have had her baby with her and then the killer found the baby either, you know, already deceased from being left in the car for a long time or he smothered the baby and buried her on the beach to just get rid of any potential, you know, people that can identify him eventually if she remembers someday, or some people don't even know that a two-year-old can't identify them, so maybe they thought, like, this baby could identify me if I'm eventually caught. I don't know what could be running through this person's head, but I do think that that's how it went down, and I do think the baby is a victim of the same killer who killed Peaches. The only real outlier here is this unidentified biological Asian male who was found in female clothing, I do wish we knew exactly what kind of clothing. Was it something that a sex worker would typically wear or was it something that you wear to a day in the office? I don't really know. So, if this person was a transgender woman who was working as an escort, then this could fit the bill for being a victim of the Long Island serial killer. So, we definitely cannot count this person out as being connected. So, the unidentified Asian biological male was not found wrapped in burlap. So, that could tell us one of two things. Either this person was killed at the same time or around the same time as Peaches and this person just was not dismembered, or this person is the most recent victim of the Long Island serial killer, at least that we know of, because maybe the killer was no longer putting them in burlap. And obviously, we know that police were able to come out with a sketch of this unidentified Asian biological male, so that makes me think that he wasn't completely decomposed to the point of not being able to be identified. So that can definitely tell us that maybe this was the most recent victim and that once Shannon went missing and everyone was searching the beaches and there were people flooding the area, that that's when this killer stopped. I don't think it's a coincidence that all of the murders were grouped in the way that I just discussed. The earliest three victims were killed in the most vicious, most careless ways, and they were not even attempted to be hidden. Those ones left the most evidence. They were the most sloppy. They had DNA on them, and eventually, obviously, it led to him being caught. Two years later, four more women are killed over the span of seven years, each one being dismembered with body parts being spread out in various places, and then there is this one connection of at least part of the bodies all being found on Gilgo Beach. Then from 2007 to 2010, there are four more bodies also found in the same area, but this time they are not dismembered and they are wrapped in burlap. When you put it this way, it does show that it is possible that the same person is responsible for all of these murders, but evolved in their methods over the years. So, with all of that being said, we're still kind of talking about John at this point. Police have come out and said that there's no concrete evidence that connects John to being the Long Island serial killer, but they have said that they are not ruling him out either. Now, before we get on to the next suspect, I do want to pause because as a whole, it's been said that it's unknown whether the original four found that were killed again from 2007 to 2010 are connected to the other six bodies found. Again, they all have different methods of being disposed. Either way, whether it was John or not, I think the explanation stays the same. So, let's say that John isn't the Long Island serial killer and that these three earlier victims are not connected to the Long Island serial killer. Let's say that the Long Island serial killer starts in 1996 with Jane Doe at number seven, aka Fire Island Jane Doe. The grouping stays the same, we just aren't counting the original three very sloppy and very careless murders. From 1996, from 2003, he still dismembers them. Then there's a four-year pause. Either there's a four-year pause or, you know, these other victims are just not connected to him and there's more out there, but 
you know, this not hidden in the same place. But for the sake of the argument, let's just say that there's a four-year pause because then from 2007 to 2010, he no longer sees a need to dismember them or maybe he just frankly got tired of all of the effort or both. So instead of taking the time to dismember because it's not something that we want to think about, but just try to imagine for a minute how much effort that would take that would be a lot. Just think of how strong your joints are, how strong even your skin is. It takes a lot of effort to dismember somebody. So if he just got tired of it and realized like, I'm not being caught, so why am I going to take all the time to dismember them when I could just put them in a burlap sack and bury them on the beach? That's probably what he ended up doing. So I don't want to rule out the possibility of all of these victims being connected just because their method of disposal doesn't match perfectly. So moving on from that, police also believed that the suspect is a white man at the time being in his 20s to 30s who knows the area very well. They think that he may have some sort of background in law enforcement given his ability to avoid being caught. If this is the same man who called Amanda, remember in part one I discussed that there's these seven calls to Amanda, Melissa Bartholomew's little sister, then he knows how to contact the families without being traced on his cell phones that he's using. So I do want to note that each time Amanda was called, each time the call was under three minutes and every time it was able to be traced, they were all in very densely populated areas. So this person knew how to avoid being traced because again, if you're in a crowd of thousands of people, if you're in a city with millions of people, it's going to be very, very hard to pinpoint one person when thousands if not millions of phones are pinging off of the same towers. So with all of that being said, let's get into the next possible suspect. There is a speculation regarding the former Suffolk County Police Chief James Burke. So it has been said that in his early days of his career, James Burke was caught having sexual relationships with sex workers and for using drugs. In the 1990s, he was caught having relations with a sex worker on duty while in uniform in his police car. At the time, he was just a police officer, but obviously this meant that he violated multiple police protocols. Then there was a man named Thomas Spoda, who was a lawyer at the police union at the time. He represented James's case at the time, and he worked out a plea deal to basically save his job. By 2001, Spoda was elected as district attorney, and from there, James Burke was promoted within the police department multiple times. So by 2012, James Burke was made police chief. So it's thought that even though he had all of these things on his record, even though he's sort of known for being involved with sleeping with sex workers and using drugs, he still somehow managed to be promoted to police chief. Part of that is thought to be because of his close relationship with Thomas Spada, who was the district attorney at the time. By later that year, in 2012, not even a year into him being police chief, a 26-year-old man named Christopher Leob broke into James's car. So Christopher was a heroin user who regularly broke into cars around Long Island to find things to sell and fund his addiction. On this day, Christopher broke into a GMC Yukon and he stole a duffel bag out of the car. In the duffel bag, he found a gun belt, a box of ammo, a Huberner cabinet with cigars in it, and then a canvas bag containing a bunch of sex toys and porn videos. But he was caught by December 14th, 2012, and was taken in for questioning. Of course, it turned out that this Yukon belonged to James Burke. According to court records, once Christopher was taken into the interrogation room, he was handcuffed to the table and then Burke grabbed Christopher's head and then slammed his face against the table and then screamed in his face that he would inject him with so much heroin that he was going to die. Then Christopher came back and called Burke a pervert for all of the things that he found in his car and this led Burke into 
was such a rage that he started attacking Christopher and he had to be pulled off of him by other officers to avoid injuring him. After this, there were a string of other police officials involved in trying to cover up this police brutality. Thomas Boda and other high-ranking county prosecutors were charged with federal charges in relation to covering up and suppressing evidence. Now, after this whole incident of Burke attacking Christopher, Christopher went in front of a judge and he was held on a $500,000 bail, which is unusually high for a car break-in. Months later, Christopher and his attorney came forward to accuse the police of police brutality and from there, the courts triggered a civil rights investigation. Then, Burke tried to claim that he had just popped his head into the interrogation room that day. There actually turned out to be three other officers who saw Burke beating Christopher that day, and all of them came out with the same story, saying that he just popped his head in. Then, another county prosecutor, Christopher McPartland, as well as Thomas Spoda, were both involved in pushing the story of Burke just popping his head in. For the years that followed, federal investigators were buying what they were selling, but there was a rat who was coming forward to them with what actually happened. By 2015, there was a meeting where McPartland thought that the rat was Spoda and that if any other officers cooperated, that they would never work for the police station again and he will see to that. But the person coming forward turned out to be a man named James Hickey, who is the police commander of the three cops who were involved in covering up Burke beating Christopher. He didn't say anything at first due to the threats against him. One of the threats McPartland allegedly made was that he said that if he said anything that he would reveal to his wife that he was cheating on her. Hickey got so paranoid about the entire situation that he was actually hospitalized in a stress-induced delirium because he was so worried about what would happen to his family if he came forward with the information that he knew. But in October of 2015, when Hickey received a subpoena from a grand jury, he decided to plead guilty for his role in conspiracy and he cooperated with the prosecution as their star witness. After the trial, the 12 jurors decided to side with Hickey and they believed his testimony enough that after four weeks of trial, both Thomas Boda and Christopher McPartland were found guilty on four counts including obstruction of justice and witness tampering. Then by 2016, James Burke was also taken to trial and he pled guilty to a civil rights violation in regards to the beating, he was sent to prison for 46 months. Now, if you're wondering what was so damning on those videotapes that James Burke wanted to cover it up so bad, then just wait, because it's pretty bad. According to Christopher, in that duffel bag, he found a pink sex toy, handcuffs, a whistle, and several porn DVDs. Christopher went on to say that he put one of the DVDs into a DVD player and he was very disturbed by what he saw, so disturbed that he could only watch two minutes of the video. He claims that he saw a man in a mask torturing a girl who he thought was a sex worker. She was tied up with her hands and feet bound behind her back, and she had makeup running down her back because she was scared to death in this video. He said that this video was a smut film, but it was actually recording a real murder. I don't know if anybody else has seen these tapes, but I don't think that what Christopher has said is officially confirmed, but at the same time, I don't see how somebody is just going to go out of their way to make up something so specific and accuse somebody of something so extreme. But it was said by the federal prosecutor for Burke's case that his motive for beating Christopher was to conceal what was on these videos. So whether Burke was just embarrassed of having a porn collection in his car or if Christopher is telling the truth about what was on the videos, we don't completely know. But at the same time, I don't see someone going to these lengths to hide something that so many other people partake in. Millions of other men, I'm sure, have, you know, porn collections or whatever, especially during this time. So, I don't know what he's trying to hide so badly that he beats Christopher and then tries to cover up 
that entire thing just because he had a porn collection. But beyond what we discussed with this, there's more testimony from another witness who has seen a very disturbing side to James Burke. There was a sex worker who we only know as Leanne who came forward to say that she met Burke at a house party in June of 2011. She saw that cocaine was being passed around the party and that Burke was partaking and using cocaine. She also saw that Burke had grabbed a woman by her hair and then pulled her to the ground. So that was at the first party that she witnessed this. Then, two months later, she bumped into him once again at the same house, but at a different party. She said that he paid her to have sex with him, but he wasn't able to, if you know what I mean, so this made him extremely angry, and he forced her to give him oral sex. She did so, but he still could not get it up, so he became so aggressive that she started tearing up. She said that it wasn't from her crying that she was tearing up, but from her gagging due to how aggressive and forceful he was, she said that the whole experience was just so dehumanizing for her. Afterwards, she says that he called her a whore and then threw $300 at her. She said that at this time, she didn't know exactly who he was, only that he was a high-ranking official in the Suffolk Police. She said that at the time, she was in college in a forensic major, so she thought that going along with him would help her further herself in her area of study. That maybe she would provide these services for him and that he would return by giving her connections into the police department. She also went on to say that she did see Joseph Brewer at one of these parties as well, which if you remember from part one, was the same man who hired Shannon on the night that she went missing. So, Leanne said that she only learned about James Burke's true identity when she recognized him on TV after his arrest from beating Christopher. So, this woman places Burke at the scene of a party on Oak Beach, the same area where Shannon went missing and right by Gilgo Beach where all of these other remains were found. So, she called the police to report that this man may have connections to being the Long Island serial killer, especially knowing how he treats women. Now, of course, Suffolk police have come out and said that there is absolutely no evidence of James Burke being the Long Island serial killer. However, as we said from before, the person responsible is thought to have some sort of law enforcement background. Then we know that James Burke clearly has this urge to sleep with sex workers, but he's incredibly aggressive and dehumanizing towards them. Then, in addition to this, he has also been criticized for trying to stifle the FBI's efforts in assisting them on the Long Island serial killer case. He even pulled Suffolk County detectives off of the task force in 2012. So, with all of that being said, obviously, there's no concrete evidence that shows that he is the killer of these 10 victims. But many people think that his behavior towards sex workers, his clear history of abusing and threatening witnesses, these videos that he allegedly have of the torture of bound and gagged women, and his proximity to all of these locations, they all can pinpoint towards him being responsible. I will say though that to me, in my opinion, if he is involved, I don't think that it's this big cover-up by the police department like in Christopher's case. Just knowing that someone came forward in that case in a much smaller case than him being a literal serial killer, that makes me think that if anybody else knew in the department that he was responsible for 10 vicious murders, I don't see a world where nobody would come forward with that information. Not saying that it's not possible that he's involved, but I do think that if he is, not many people, if anybody, know about it. I will say that if he isn't responsible, then it is possible that he's just a really awful person who doesn't care about women and who really just treats women who work as escorts really badly. I think that it can be explained that him wanting to tamper down the efforts and trying to find out who the Long Island serial killer is this can be explained by the fact that he just purely hates and has so much disregard for these women, so much so that he feels that investigating their murders is just a waste of resources. So, I do think that that could explain why he doesn't want to investigate this case, again, just because of the hatred that he has towards these women. 
I do think that there are a lot of things that do point towards him being responsible, but I do think that they can be explained away pretty easily. So once again, with him, I don't know if he's involved and I don't know if I think he's involved. I think it's more likely that he's not, but I don't want to completely disregard that possibility. So the final suspect that I want to discuss is Dr. Peter Hackett. Peter Hackett is a man in his late 50s to early 60s who lived in Oak Beach. He was a retired emergency services doctor who was well known around the area as being a helpful, pleasant man. Neighbors described that any time they needed help with something small or something big in an emergency, he was always there to help. He was married and the father of two children, a boy and a girl, but something about him just wasn't right. So, Two days after Shannon's disappearance by May 3rd, Dr. Hackett had given Mari, Shannon's mother, a phone call. When she answered, he introduced himself as being Dr. Peter Hackett, and he asked her if she has seen her daughter, Shannon. This immediately struck Mari as being strange. She said, no, she hasn't seen her, and so she asked him who he is again. And he actually apparently said that he is a Suffolk County police surgeon and a medical examiner. He also apparently said that he had a doctor's office in Oak Beach where he ran a clinic for drug addicted girls and sex workers. And he said that he had basically a halfway house where he kept these women safe. So he told her in this phone call not to worry about Shannon. He said that Shannon had run over to his house on the night that she went missing. So as I explained before, she ran over to Gustav's house and then to Barbara's house where she then ran off and Michael couldn't find her afterwards. However, we now learn that apparently she had also ran over to Dr. Peter Hackett's house after Barbara's house. He explained to Mari that when she got there, she was knocking on his door very erratically, so he answered. He said that he gave her some sort of drug to try and calm her down and collect herself that night. Mari, of course, asked him how he even got her phone number, and he said that all of the girls that went into his halfway house had to give him an emergency contact, and Shannon gave him her number. But this really confused Mari because she just did not think that Shannon would give him her number as an emergency contact. Again, the two weren't the closest and she didn't want to rely on Mari for her help. So there is really no reason why she would have given him her number as an emergency contact. Also at this point, Mari said that she didn't even know that Shannon was missing and it definitely was not public knowledge. So it was actually after this call that the family finally reported her as a missing person. After getting this call, Mari's daughter and Shannon's sister, Sherry, went back to talk to Dr. Hackett about the call to follow up. However, by that point, Dr. Hackett denied that he ever made this call to begin with. He stated that he never actually spoke to Mari and he said that he had never seen Shannon in his life. He also claimed that he had never seen Michael or his neighbor, John Brewer, in his life either. Beyond that, there is more to know about Dr. Peter Hackett. There had been rumors going around the community that he had been using his medical license to illegally prescribe pharmaceuticals. He is thought to mainly prescribe opioids, but he's rumored to use opioids himself as well. It also came out that he was not even running any sort of halfway house or wayward house for girls. Then, phone records actually came out to show that Dr. Hackett did in fact call Mari, but he did so from his wife's cell phone on the afternoon of May 3rd. It's still to this day unknown how this man even got Mari's phone number, and at the time that he called, Shannon has not been publicly known as missing yet, so there's no way that he could have known to look her up and somehow find Mari's phone number in, you know, the phone books or on the internet yet, so it's still not known how he even contacted her to begin with. Then, going beyond that, when looking into location data from the cell phone that he used to call Mari, it showed that he actually was not in Oak Beach in his home at the time that he made this call. He was actually near Mari's home in New Jersey, so he drove all the way to New Jersey near Shannon's mother's home just to make this phone call, which is backed by records and then to go on to lie about it. 
Then by May 6th, Dr. Hackett made two more phone calls. One was to Shannon's boyfriend, Alex, and then one was to Mari again. When later asked about these phone calls, he said that he just called them to wish them well. But this goes against his original earlier statements that he made to police, where he originally said that he hadn't spoken to anybody in Shannon's family until May 9th. So, when he was asked about these inconsistencies by the show The First 48, Dr. Hackett wrote a total of two letters to the show. One letter was in May of 2011, and then the other was in June of 2011. These letters read as follows. Any important story is worth getting right. In response to your letter, I will share only the facts that I am aware of. When I heard the name of a person named Shannon Gilbert, she was already missing. I never met her. I never treated her and I never spoke with her. She was never in my home. I greeted the people looking for her by chance. I recall the first people were Mike and Alex. I provided them with my calling card should I be able to help and encouraged them to follow up with the police. I returned a call as requested. Since I had never met Shannon, it obviously did not have anything to do with permission to treat her. It was supportive and that was all. That call was last May and perhaps that is why it is being reported inaccurately. I also met some of her family when they came to our neighborhood on Mother's Day, May 9th, 2010 to post signs and go door to door asking questions. When months went by and nothing was heard, we assumed that Shannon must have returned home. I am sorry this was not the case. I had nothing to do with anything that occurred the night that Shannon went missing. I was home, sleeping with my wife. The police continued their investigation. I, along with many neighbors in this community, have cooperated with them. I will not be granting an interview. Being a parent, I cannot imagine Mrs. Gilbert's pain. My wife and I keep her family in our prayers. One can only hope that the current media attention will assist in some new information that will lead to closure for the Gilbert family. The second letter, written a month later, states, Quote, I hope this letter answers some of the questions that you raised when we spoke last Friday. I had met Shannon's boyfriend Alex and driver Mike when they came to my community to look for Shannon in the days following her disappearance. I gave them my contact information should I be able to help in any way. During my conversations with them, they asked that I call the family. My wife and I checked our long-distance phone bills. There is only one bill which has calls documented to Kingston, New York. It shows that I spoke with Alex on May 6, 2010 at 7.20 p.m. and at 7.25 p.m. I called, and this is blacked out, at his request and spoke with Mrs. Gilbert. We spoke for four minutes. On May 9th, 2010, at 12.06 p.m., I called blacked out, and I think it was a sister's number. That call was also four minutes. These calls were over a year ago now, and the exact content is difficult to remember, but at no time during any of my conversations with Shannon's friends or family did I suggest that I had ever met her or render her medical care of any sort. As I previously mentioned, with Mrs. Gilbert, her sisters, and friends in the presence of my guests and family on Mother's Day, May 9th, 2010, when they were distributing missing persons posters, we answered questions for them to the best of our ability. At no point were we dismissive, however, we emphasized the need to follow up with the police departments involved and we parted on friendly terms. I am perplexed as to why, almost a year later, I became a person of interest to the family and the media. I do not even know who Joseph Brewer was until after this incident. In May, my wife and I were preparing for both high school and college graduations. I drove cross-country with my eldest daughter to her new job. Since we had heard no news about the missing woman, we thought that she may have gone home. In December, when the newspapers reported a body found, we realized otherwise. You asked me why I didn't take a polygraph test. I was willing, but I learned that certain health issues that I am being treated for would negate its results, therefore its interpretation. Frankly, since I am not a suspect, it would be a waste of time and resources. I am allergic to dogs, but welcome the cadaver dogs to come through my home and my property. They found no evidence. Once again, I emphasize my fervent hopes that Shannon is found alive, and if there was foul play, that justice can take its course. So, that is what Dr. Hackett had to say about all of this. I will note that he does have a heart condition. He has history of atrial fibrillation, so it makes sense why he wouldn't want to take a polygraph test, so he's not just blowing smoke for that, but that is all I will say about that. Then, a year after Shannon's disappearance, 
Mari started confronting Dr. Hackett herself about his involvement in Shannon's death. And again, he claimed that he knew nothing about it. As the efforts to search for Shannon ramped up, Mari was pushing for the marsh behind Dr. Hackett's house to be drained. Dr. Hackett fought this at first, but eventually he did allow it to be drained, and this is around the same time that her body was found. Like I said earlier, they had found her cell phone as well as a couple of items of clothing in the same area a couple of days before her body was found. But what I didn't mention was that the area that Janin's body was found is actually viewable if you're standing on the back porch of Dr. Hackett's house. So Mari was convinced that Dr. Hackett was the one responsible for Shannon's death. As we know, he lives right next door to the last house that she is confirmed to have knocked on their door. He somehow knew about Shannon going missing before it was made public news. He explained that, you know, this was when they were putting up missing persons posters for her, but records showed that he called Mari before even she knew that she was a missing person, so this doesn't align with what he's saying. Then he somehow knew to contact Mari. Once again, he claims that she gave him her contact information or that Alex gave him the family's contact information, but they're all denying that they ever did so. And then there's this whole story where he apparently claimed that he had seen her on the night that she went missing and that he did render her medical help. Then the area where her body was found is literally viewable from his home. So I don't know if any of this points to the possibility of him being the Long Island serial killer. The unknown subject is thought to be in his 20s or 30s back in 2009, and at the time, Dr. Hackett was in his late 50s or 60s. So for the sake of this theory, I think it's more likely that if he is responsible for Shannon's death, that he is responsible for Shannon's death alone and that she is not the victim of the Long Island serial killer, but of Dr. Hackett who acted this one time and this one time only. So that being said, police have said that they cleared Dr. Hackett of having any involvement. He has since moved to Florida away from his home saying that he just could no longer stand the speculation and the harassment that he gets from this entire situation. Now, when it comes to the odd behaviors that Dr. Hackett was exhibiting, people who know Dr. Hackett say that he is a serial exaggerator. He's a man who likes to stick his nose in business that it doesn't belong. He likes to get involved in things so that he can tell these extravagant stories. It's also been said that him and the one neighbor, Gustav, are pretty good friends. Now, other sources say that Dr. Hackett denied even knowing Gustav, but other sources say that they actually were pretty good friends. So, it is possible that Dr. Hackett learned about this crazy story of this girl knocking on Gustav's door, him calling police, and then her just disappearing into thin air, and then, you know, the next day people are coming around and looking for her. So, Dr. Hackett takes that as an opportunity to insert himself into this story that he has nothing to do with, and he decides to claim involvement in some way just to get some sort of attention. Then it's possible that somehow he got into contact with Mari. Maybe Alex was going around looking for Shannon and gave the family's contact information to Gustav, who then gave it to Dr. Hackett. I haven't heard anything about this, but I do know that Gustav has since passed away, so there's really no way to ask him about this aspect of it but it's always possible that Dr. Hackett got the contact information from Gustav and just hasn't told anybody. Maybe again, he inserted himself into this whole situation just so he had this interesting story to tell and that he could say that, you know, he had involvement, but when he realized that she actually died and that, you know, now it's being connected to this big serial killer case, he realized that he dug himself far too deep and that he needed to get out of this as soon as possible. So I do think that this could explain it, that this is just a really weird guy who likes to put his nose where it doesn't belong. We know that there's people out there who do this, unfortunately, for some reason, who like to just pretend like they're a part of this really interesting thing that happened, even though they had nothing to do with it. I'm sure you know someone like that in your life, probably not to this extent, but who will claim like, oh, I was near, you know, this big thing when it happened, even though I had nothing to do with it and I had no idea that it happened until the news came out about it, I was near it. People try to insert themselves into these crazy stories so often and I think that it's possible that that's what he was doing. 
But the one thing that irks me about this though is how he drove near Mari's house just to make this phone call. I, that really irks me about this entire thing. Why go all that way just to make this phone call? Why not just make it from your home? That part is really strange to me. And then again, we know the fact that her body was found within view of his back porch. So those two things really irk me. But again, we don't know why he did these things. He explains them or he denies them. We don't really know, but he could just be trying to insert himself into a situation where he doesn't belong. In 2013, Mari had actually filed a wrongful death suit against Dr. Hackett. Her attorney claimed that Dr. Hackett had claimed to have medicated Shannon because she was so upset. Two neighbors did come forward to say that they have seen him treating other people illegally with opioids, so that's basically what the suit was claiming. They stated, quote, the plaintiff claims that Shannon's belongings were found approximately 30 yards behind the home of the defendant, Dr. Charles Peter Hackett in Oak Beach, New York on Jones Beach Island. More than a year later, Shannon's badly decomposed body was discovered approximately half a mile from there in the heavily thickened marsh that lies between Oak Beach and Ocean Parkway. During the evening prior to her disappearance, Shannon reportedly had been present at a party at the home of one of Dr. Hackett's Oak Beach neighbors. Plaintiff claims that Dr. Hackett led Shannon and later her mother, Mari Gilbert, to believe that he owned and operated a home for, quote, wayward females out of his Oak Beach house and that he would render, quote, aid to her there, including medical treatment. That Shannon, in fact, came under Dr. Hackett's care and control and was administered medication by him. That Shannon was in such a state of confusion and, quote, mental derangement at the time that she was, quote, incapable of making any informed decisions and of understanding her own or her surrounding circumstances. Of course, Dr. Hackett and his family denied these allegations and due to the statute of limitations, the case was quickly dropped. So, in terms of suspects, these are the three people that have been speculated as being the Long Island serial killer. But we don't know, of course, if any one of these men are responsible or if there's somebody else out there going around and killing these women. By January of 2022, police actually came forward in a press conference about information regarding a piece of evidence that was found early in the investigation. This was a leather belt which had the initials of either HM or WH written in the leather. They said that they believed that this belt was handled by the suspect and did not belong to any of the victims. They said that they found it early in the investigation, but haven't released when or where. So all of the evidence that I brought forward throughout these two videos was all of the evidence that was released at different times in the investigation. So even though I put it into a timeline of when these things happened, it's not necessarily when this information was released to the public. So, for example, Shannon's 911 calls weren't released until just recently. Then, the surveillance video of Megan Waterman also wasn't released until about six months ago. Then, we have this belt, which was just recently released two years ago. So, we have all of these different suspects and all of these different things surrounding them that make them look like possible suspects, but we didn't know all of this information at once. All of this was coming out at different times, so I used all of this evidence to put it in a timeline that makes it more understandable, even though these things came out all at different times. Then we have Shannon herself. Her going missing is really what jump-started the discovery of all of these bodies on or near Gilgo Beach, but police still believe that she was not killed. They think that her death was accidental, so we discussed these different theories and all of these 10 victims and how they can all be connected. However, when it comes to Shannon, I genuinely don't know what to think. So some of the people that have been looked at in terms of being involved in Shannon's case include Michael, Joseph Brewer, as well as Dr. Hackett, all as possibly being responsible for Shannon's murder, but not necessarily being the Long Island serial killer. Some people think that it was Joseph Brewer and Michael Pack working together to kill her. Some people think that it was Michael Pack by himself. So when it comes to Mike, some people have questioned why when Mike was trying to get her to come with him, she was suddenly scared of him. Mike is supposed to be her safe place. 
If something goes wrong, she goes to Mike and they leave. So why was she suddenly scared of him? Was it because she knew that he wanted to hurt her? If we remember from part one, he did say that, you know, the two of them left Joseph's house for 15 minutes to go get drugs. But we know that according to her toxicology report, she hadn't taken any. So why did he say that this was a drug run? Now, it was said that there was this other witness who claimed to see them leaving the house of Joseph Brewer. We don't know why, but Mike's the one that said that it probably was to go get drugs. So, was this just an assumption based on her past behaviors that she was going out and getting drugs? Or is it a lie on Michael's part? Then we also know that Mike is technically the last person to have seen Shannon alive because he was following her around with his SUV. Then we know that after he couldn't see her anymore, he stopped looking for her and then he didn't say anything to Shannon's family because he just assumed that somehow she made it home. Don't know how else he thought she was gonna get home, but he said that he thought she made it home somehow. So I do think that in terms of Mike being responsible, let's sort of go down that avenue of how that could have happened. I do think that if he was following her around and then he did catch up with her, he did get her into the car and she was in this state of being in an unconsolable panic and was freaking out, maybe, you know, he forced her into his car to get her to go home, all with perfectly good intentions. But maybe once she was in the car with him, she started scratching him or kicking him or something like that while trying to get away because she was just in this state of not really knowing what was going on around her, thinking that he was out to get her, so she was really going in on him, thinking that she was trying to defend herself. But then maybe he was starting to lose his patience with her, and then in some sort of rage, he reacted and he accidentally killed her. Maybe he was trying to calm her down, pushed her down, something like that, was trying to restrain her, and he got so frustrated that he choked her or something like that to get her to stop. Maybe there was a situation where he accidentally hit her with his car while he was following her and she died because of that, so he panicked and dumped her body in the marsh. So to me, those are really only the possible scenarios of him wanting to kill her. I don't see a situation where he planned to kill her, where this was a premeditated thing because his history just does not show that. She did trust him for the most part and, you know, Joseph hasn't said anything about him having this weird behavior where he thought that maybe Mike wanted to hurt her. There's nothing else that came out about him to make me think that he's suspicious in any other way. So I do think that if he is responsible, that this was a manslaughter or second degree murder type of situation. Then of course, people think that Michael Brewer on his own is the one responsible. Some people say that it's Peter Hackett. So for this case, then obviously I don't think that if they're the ones who killed her, I don't think she's the victim of the Long Island serial killer because I don't think any of these three men, so Mike, Joseph, or Peter Hackett, I don't think any of them are the serial killer. They could be, but in my opinion, I just don't think that they are. They do live very close to Gilgo Beach. They do, you know, have connections to the area. Joseph is known to hire escorts, but I feel like if he was going to kill her, then when they drove off for that 15 minutes, maybe he would have done it then. I don't really know. I think that maybe there's a situation where they drove off for that 15 minutes, he tried killing her, and then somehow was not successful, so they came back, and that's why, you know, Shannon was freaking out at that point, but I don't know why then Joseph would come out to her driver and say, yo, come get your girl or whatever, so I don't see how that situation would make any sense. I personally think that if Joseph was responsible that he would have gone out there and been like hey you should leave like Shannon's staying the night like there's no reason for you to be here anymore and then he would have made sure to wait until Mike leaves to actually kill her because it makes absolutely no sense for him to kill her while Mike is still there because obviously he's going to be a witness. I don't know with this whole situation there's clearly a reason that Shannon started freaking out. I don't think it was just a situation of like 
nothing was happening and then all of a sudden Shannon broke. I think maybe Joseph said something to her or did something to her that caused this, whether it was him trying to do something weird with her that she really didn't like that made her think that he wanted to hurt her, whether he said something to her, maybe he said something about the other bodies hidden. I don't really know, but I do think that something happened that made her freak out. Again, I don't think it was completely out of the blue, but at the same time, I don't see how Joseph could be the Long Island serial killer, but there's always that possibility. I just don't think we know enough about Joseph to point towards him being responsible for anything other than Shannon's murder, but at the same time, again, he does live close to the area and it could make sense if we knew more about him. So, with that being said, if Shannon is the victim of the Long Island serial killer, I just don't know how that would have happened. So, let's assume for now that it's not Dr. Hackett, that it's not Mike, and that it's not Joseph. How would she have happened to see him or catch up with him in that moment? Maybe, you know, she caught him in the act of burying someone and then he killed her because of that and she just happened to be a sex worker. That would be the world's biggest coincidence that she happens to be a sex worker and caught this man burying someone and that, you know, she was just killed because of that. So, I don't think that that's true. I do think it's possible that maybe she had another date set up after Joseph and that she had planned on meeting up with him and that the reason she sort of freaked out was maybe because Joseph got upset that he wanted her the rest of the night and that she had this other date set up. So, you know, she left because of that and then, you know, eventually after running off, she did make it to this guy. Maybe, you know, she had a burner phone that he was contacting him and she met up with him, he picked her up and then killed her and that's why maybe Mike lost sight of her because she was running off somewhere to hide, call this guy, say, hey, come pick me up for our date and then he did and killed her in the area. I do know that a lot of the escorts will set up multiple dates in a row, obviously to make the most money possible, so it is possible that she met up with him that night and that you know, that's why she was found in the marsh and that's why she was found in the same area is because that's where he dumped her but I just don't know. I don't know how possible that is. She doesn't necessarily fit in with the other ones because her items were found and none of the personal belongings were found with almost any of the other victims with the exception of the jewelry. Then again, with Shannon's whole situation, we have to wonder why she was in this panic. Was she on drugs and the toxicology report just didn't pick it up because she was so decomposed? Did something happen with Joseph that made her think that her life was in danger? We don't really know, but I do genuinely think that something happened that made her freak out like that. Again, we do know that she did have this diagnosis of bipolar disorder, so did she just have this mental break out of nowhere? I personally don't think so. Something had to have caused it, but I guess it's possible that in this moment she realized that, you know, something was going on or I really honestly, I don't know. People do have panic attacks out of absolutely nowhere and that's totally possible that that's what happened to her, but I think the whole situation surrounding it just, it would be too much of a coincidence. I really don't know what to make of Shannon's death. If she truly was strangled like the second medical examiner had said, then who did it? I do think that Dr. Hackett could be involved because of the things that we discussed earlier. But if he is responsible, then what is his motive? What is his reasoning for strangling this random girl that just appeared on his doorstep at 5 a.m. on a random day with his wife and children at home? None of this adds up to me, especially in terms of Shannon's death herself. It's like the more research I do, the more confused I become. So when it comes to Shannon's case, I am really looking forward to hearing what you all think about it because out of all of these situations, hers makes the least sense to me and she's the one that we know the most about. So, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all think about all of this. Now, when it comes to the actual identity of the Long Island serial killer, of the people we discussed, I personally don't think it's Dr. Hackett or James Burke. As crappy as a human being as James Burke is, I don't see that there's very much evidence that actually points towards him as being responsible. He, again, treats women, especially sex workers, very, very, very poorly and honestly, I wouldn't be mad if he went to jail for other things and had a very miserable life because of the things that he's being accused of. 
just because of how he treats people, but I personally don't think that he actually is the Long Island serial killer. I do think that if it turned out to be one of the people that we discussed today, I think the most likely person and the person that would surprise me the least is John Bitroff. I don't know if I believe that he would have killed these two to three women and then just stopped afterwards. There is a lot more pointing towards him being responsible than any of the other people that we talked about. That is for sure. I think that it's very likely that he is the Long Island serial killer. So if it all came out that he was the Long Island serial killer, I wouldn't be surprised. But if it turns out to be someone that we didn't even talk about that's completely flying under the radar right now, I also wouldn't be surprised. This is such a long and confusing case. It has so many twists and turns. It's just unbelievable. But at this point, that is all of the information that I know on this case. I will say that there is a Netflix documentary on this case, or at least on the Gilgo 4. This has reenactments and actors, I believe, and it's been said that a lot of their focus is on Dr. Peter Hackett. As I researched, I did find the documentary, but I chose not to watch it because, again, a lot of the feedback said that it is really good, but the biggest thing that I heard about this documentary is that the creators of this film spend a lot of their time on Dr. Hackett, so I will probably watch this film on my own after recording this series, but I didn't want to watch it before because I don't want outside opinions to influence my own decision making and my own opinions, if that makes sense. I want to read the articles for myself and then come to my own conclusions based on the unbiased information that I'm reading and then make it into a video to give you the most most unbiased, neutral standpoints that I can without being, you know, influenced by outside opinions. I am very open-minded, especially when it comes to this case, so if I watch a case that really goes in on Dr. Hackett, I can see how I could get influenced by that and think that it's him, and then if I see another one where I really think, you know, that James Burke is involved, I could start thinking that it's him because there's one really long, you know, podcast about James Burke's involvement and then this documentary I'm talking about with Dr. Peter Hackett's involvement, so I didn't want to be swayed in any one direction. I wanted to read the information, present it to you guys how I was able to interpret it, and then come to my own conclusions and let you guys come to your own conclusions. I think this is the longest amount of time I've spent on any one case, and it's the longest video I have probably on my channel. It's the longest series I have, but this case really needed the time. I tried my absolute best to give you the most information about each victim that I could, but some people just unfortunately did not have a lot of information about themselves online, which definitely is unfortunate. You know I like to go into the background and the history of each victim, but that just is not possible when there's so many people and so many people that aren't identified and so many people that you know, had these types of lives where they, you know, lived and kept a lot of information to themselves, didn't, you know, make a lot of things about themselves public, maybe didn't spend as much time with their family as some people do, so there just isn't a lot of information about some of these victims, which again is unfortunate, but I did my best. But either way, I cannot believe I'm saying it, but that is all I have for this series. Thank you all so much for sticking with me through these two very long videos and through this whole fiasco of like my voice going out and me sounding nasally and the other ones. I was like, of course, the one time I have this really long video series to do is when my voice goes out. So you should have heard it. This is Thursday that I'm recording this on Tuesday. Oh my gosh, I literally could not talk. I was like, that's just my luck. But I'm so happy that I was able to record this video, even if I sound a little bit scratchy, even if tomorrow I lose my voice a little bit more because I abused my voice today and talked a lot. So wish me luck with that. But thank you guys all so much for sticking with me through all of this. Thank you guys for being here for my very first creep week. I absolutely love the series that I'm doing. I think it's a great opportunity to look into these more involved cases and next week we're going to be talking about an actual serial killer who has been identified so that one will be interesting to do a dive into the psychology and why this person does what they do. This case was a great one to look at all the victims and think how are they similar? How are they different? Can we connect them? What makes it seem like all of them could be the work of one killer? 
or is it multiple? So that's why I'm very interested in this case and that is why next week I'm going to do a little bit of a different case where we do know who the serial killer is, we do know the victims, we do know the outcome of the case, but we can examine what this person was thinking and how they got to be where they are. But with that, I cannot wait to hear what all of you have to say about this case. I literally will be refreshing the comments after I post this video to see what all of you guys think. So please let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If I didn't mention something that you thought of, please let me know that as well. If I said something that doesn't make sense to you and needs clarification, please comment that as well. Comment any thought that you have because I'm really looking forward to dissecting this one with all of you guys. Do you think all of these victims are connected? Do you think that this is the work of one killer or many killers? Do you think that these victims are grouped in this way because they're the work of three different killers? Do you think that the Long Island serial killer killed Shannon as well or do you think that she is a completely separate case from all of this? What do you think about the suspects that I mentioned? Do you think that any of them could be the Long Island serial killer? What do you think of Mike, Joseph, and Dr. Hackett? please let me know all of your thoughts and theories down in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos and you don't miss out on the rest of Creep Week, which will happen next week. Let me know down below if you enjoy these types of videos and if you want me to keep making them in the future. Make sure you go ahead and use my link down below and head to apostrophe.com slash Rachel Shannon and use code Rachel Shannon at checkout to get your first visit for only $5. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. I'm gonna go rest my voice now. <laughs> stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you guys next time. Bye!